Shalom. Today we're going to talk about proverbs and parables, two other literary devices that are used widely in the Bible, but also in much other literature. We tend to think of these as two different things. The word proverb means a common saying, an adage, a maxim. It comes from the roots for words that are put forward, possibly an enigmatic an enigmatic utterance, a mysterious or oracular saying that requires interpretation. A parable is an allegorical or metaphorical narrative, usually having a moral for instruction. And we'll talk about the etymology, the word origin of parable in a minute. It can be a saying or a story in which something is expressed in terms of something else. So, for example, in Proverbs 10.20, the tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. This is pretty straightforward. It doesn't require a deep interpretation. Is your tongue made of silver? No, but the person who speaks justly, who speaks upright words, that is a good thing. That's a thing of value. But the heart of the wicked is of very little value. Matthew thirteen thirty one. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is not a literal mustard seed, but in terms of how the mustard seed grows, this is an allegorical. We tend to think of the Proverbs as being Old Testament Proverbs and parables as being how Yeshua spoke. But in fact, there are proverbs in the New Testament, we will see, and also parables in the Old Testament. So interestingly, in Hebrew, in the Tanakh, there is only one word which is translated as proverb and parable, and that is the word mashal. Now you may be familiar with the name of the book of Proverbs in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, and that name is Mishle. So it is not just the plural of mashal, mishalim, we might expect, but this is a grammatical use. And you see I have circled the two dots under the lamed, the tzere, and the yud at the end of mishle. And this is a form which is called the construct. Some people call it the noun pairs. In Hebrew it's called smichut. And it just takes a masculine plural noun and makes it so it becomes of, because the name of the book of Proverbs is the Proverbs of Shlomo, of Solomon. So that Mishle, the A part there, grammatically makes it the Proverbs of Solomon. So why do we have Proverbs and, and parables? There are things because Yehovah is completely other. He's completely different from what we are. And so we cannot always apprehend with our mind who is he? What does he do? What is he like? And so we need these metaphors and similes and parables to help us understand. Another reason is for a tactful way of speaking about something. For example, when Nathan comes to David to help David understand and repent for what happened between him and Bathsheba and Uriah, her husband, he doesn't come and say, oh, you did this wicked thing. And it's very interesting because most of the paintings show Nathan the prophet pointing his finger at David. I like this picture. It's a Rembrandt. And we have the feeling that Nathan is telling him, he's telling him this parable about the poor man and the sheep and the rich man. And David is listening and he's, he's consumed with this story. But in the end, it is a parable, and he gets the meaning. He understands the allegory. When Yeshua is talking about the Pharisees, he has called them blind guides. And then he says, if a blind man leads a blind man, won't they both fall in the ditch? And this is a tactful way of him saying, you guys are off base. You're not leading the people properly. So the Greek word, parabole, is a comparison, a parable, and it comes from the idea of throwing something alongside of something. There's a juxtaposition 
of two ideas from para alongside and belay, belaying really, to throw something, throw a ball. And we have this shape, which is called a parabola. And we see that the two sides, the thing is symmetrical. It's very similar to the chiastic structure that we talked about last time. The allegory is on one side, but the truth is parallel to it on the other side. So we're going to look up some examples of this word mashal, which appears in the Hebrew in the, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh. Numbers 23, 7. And he took up his parable, this is Bil'am the prophet, and said, Balak the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How can I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom Yehovah hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. So Bilam is looking down from the hill, and he sees the camp, and he gives actually four of these prophecies but they are all called parables. He sees the people dwelling alone, and he says they are not reckoned among the nations. God has called the people to be holy, to be separate. This is why he has given the commandments. The allegory is parallel to the truth. Deuteronomy 28, 36 and 37. Yehovah shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone, and thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, a byword among all nations, whither Jehovah shall lead thee. Among the curses, if Israel is not going to follow the commandments of Jehovah, they will suffer this punishment, including idolatry, and then they will become a mashal, a proverb, Oh, they will be like Israel. Israel has done this, and the other group has also done the same thing. And we talk about it in terms of a proverb. It's the same word, though, mashal. First Kings 4.32. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, of course, speaking of Solomon, and his songs were 1,005. So we think of proverbs as being some kind of pithy saying, which teaches something. Also in Psalm 78, too, this is quite interesting. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. So the parable here is in literary parallel to the dark sayings. And I'll put a link to the video that discusses where the idea of dark sayings comes from. It's Chida. This psalm is about the exodus from Egypt. The exodus from Egypt is a mashal, parable. It's telling about something else. Even though it is a true event and it happened, it is parallel to something else. It comes into the mindset of the people as a historical meme, and it's going to represent something else. Now in Greek, there are t actually two different words, and we'll see them, but this one is the most common. It's used uh, 33 times in the Septuagint and 50 times in the New Testament. Paravoli, parable, uh, in Matthew 13.10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? However, we see it's also translated as proverb. Luke 4.23. And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself, whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. The other word, which is used uh, only three times in the Septuagint and five times in the New Testament, is paraimia, 2 Peter 2.22. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. However, in John 10, 6, we see it is translated as parable. This parable spoke Yeshua unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. 
So even though we have some very distinct ideas about the difference between a proverb and a parable, in the ancient mindset, they serve the same purpose. And as you know, Hebrew is a very function-oriented mindset. What is the function of the thing? We get one idea from of this in the modern Hebrew word, mashal, which means example. If I am talking and I say limashal, for example, and we will see that this is a good way to read this word. So going back to the root, we're going to see the verb root, mashal, Genesis 3.16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and they desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Probably a very abused piece of scripture. Is the man to rule over his wife, like wicked king, or is he to live before her according to these proverbs in parallel as a good example? Genesis 4, 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Cain had the opportunity to repent and do the right thing and resist the devil so that he could act according to righteousness. I think this helps make it a little more clear. Maybe you have wondered about this. So the very first place we see anything to do with this root is in Genesis 1.16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So how does the sun rule over the day? Does it tell us the speed limit or uh, don't steal? No. It gives us the indication of what can be done during the day and likewise at night. So we see these concepts come forth. John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The daytime, the sun is out. That is the time to work. That is how the sun rules over the day, by example. The night cometh when no man can work. Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They do not know at what they stumble. In the night, it's dark, and that the rule for that is that we don't work at night. Who works at night? Isaiah 29.15, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from Jehovah, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us, who knoweth us, wickedness is done at night in the dark. Finally, in Revelation 22, 5, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. When the Lord provides a light, there is neither day nor night, and people will act righteously according to the light that is given in the city. Now, if we look briefly at the pictographs. We find a mem, shin, lamed. So the mem is the water. And we read that the waters are always the people. Revelation 17, 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So we have the peoples. The shin, we have the change. I have talked about this very recently. I'll put a link again to the video about why I believe that shin is change. It's your teeth. People say that means destruction. No. Lishanot, the verb, means to change. And guess what? Your teeth change along with a lot of other things that are connected to that root. The people change lamed, the ox goat, the one who leads them, the one who teaches them. Lamed is to learn. When the people change who they're following, who they allow to direct them in their path, then they have a moshel, they have a ruler, they have a mashal, they have a good example of what is righteous and how to walk in this world. I pray this has been encouraging to you. Till next time, tasimit ha'inayim al ha'shamayim, 
Keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.